Welcome to the CUNY Lecture Series. In this edition, CUNY honors renowned philosopher Saul Kripke. A pioneer in the field of logic, distinguished professor of philosophy Saul Kripke has spent 40 years studying the philosophy of language and is regarded by his peers to be one of the world's greatest living philosophers. His research has led to professorships at Harvard, Princeton, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In 2001, the Swedish Academy of Sciences awarded him the Shock Prize in Logic and Philosophy, describing his work as, quote, an enormous leap forward for modal logic. This spring, CUNY created the Saul Kripke Center, a repository for the professor's articles and unpublished works at the Graduate Center. During the opening conference, Professor Kripke discusses his life's work on Gricean maxims and the relationship between language and thought. There is a distinction that really goes back to um, Burton and Russell in On Denoting, um, but um, really somehow tended to get noticed when it was revived by Klein in his paper, Quantifiers and Propositional Attitudes, and um, in Word and Object, in which he gave a different account of the matter. But on the other hand, the problem was the same. Now, as Quine pointed out, there appears to be an important distinction between statement one there is someone I believe to be a spy, and the weaker statement too, I believe that there are spies. The uh, second thing expresses a triviality. The first um, expresses some um, urgent information if it might be committed to, it might be um, uh, communicated to, say, the CIA. Now, statement one is, of course, a quantified statement. It would be um, obtained by prefixing an existential quantifier to, I believe of why that she or he is a spy. There exists a why such that um, I believe this. Now, but I don't know if anyone here has fallen into this view, but eminent and able people have. Now, calling, using standard terminology, the terminology in one and three, de re belief, and two, de dicto belief, I, I will say that uh, in, in Russell's theory, um, it's not really as if there are two kinds of beliefs, but... Uh, the way Klein presents it, it would appear that there are. And um, this is one thing that uh, Dan Dennett, whom I have handed out because it's uh, short and vigorously expressed, has um, expressed against the theory. Are there really two kinds of beliefs? See, right. And uh, in Klein's presentation, no matter, you might think this is so. But, um, a question which will naturally rise is, when does the um, de dicto formulation imply the de re formulation? Now, suppose alpha is determined, though proper names could apply here, the main important thing will be a description, a definite description. When does alpha exist, which is, uh, for the case of the description, simply that the relevant existence and uniqueness conditions are satisfied, when does, um, and five, X believes that alpha, where alpha is the description in question, is F. This is um, just supposed to express X's belief. When does it imply that X believes of alpha that it is F? Now, unrestricted exportation is a doctrine that the implication always holds. And in fact, um, one could cook it up, if things are so simple, into perhaps a, an analysis of de re belief in terms of de dicto belief. Now, this doctrine has had a very strange history. Quine originally assumed that the implication in question was correct when he 
presented the problem, right? So various people pointed out that this will uh, tend to trivialize the difference between um, one and two um, because if someone believes two, someone in capital X, uh, so believes that there are spies, then the same person will presumably believe that the tallest spy is a spy. And this was pointed out by uh, various critics. And so then this will imply by um, existential generalization that there is someone X believes to be a spy. So the distinction will be, in effect, obliterated. One might think that that would have simply sent people back to the drawing board. Um, Now, indeed, Ernest Sosa, who was one of the people who made the criticisms of Quine, also um, wrote a classic paper um, going back to the view. Um, Okay, and um, Sosa's view can be quoted, uh, Sosa's original formulation can be quoted as this. S believes about X that it is F, or believes X to be F, if and only if there is a singular term alpha such that S believes alpha is F, right? And it is it denotes X and is a distinguished term. Now, some restriction must be placed or the thing won't work. Right? I would think that this is not really even a doctrine. It just means that some restriction must be placed on the inference. Right? However, Sosa goes on to give whole bunches of examples that supposedly show that whether something is a distinguished term in this sense is totally context dependent, relative to the way you're looking at things, etc. Interest, relative, whatever you say, right? A whole bunch of examples. Um, he therefore concludes, though it is hard for me to say why anyone would ever draw such a sweeping conclusion even if they gave, say, 10 examples that there is no restriction at all, any term whatsoever in an appropriate context can be exported. Okay, so this is back to Quine's original view, right? Now, um, uh, and... Um, uh, and Dan Dennett, in which I actually, since the article is reasonably short, I um, handed out, um, uh, expresses himself um, even more vigorously in favor of Sosa. Um, he says that um, he says that. Um, that, well, the way he put it to me was he just doesn't believe, and, uh, and the way he puts it in various parts of the paper, he just doesn't believe that there is any such thing as de re belief. He um, complains in this paper beyond belief, and this is the impression you would get from Quine's formulation, no matter that people have thought that there are two different kinds of belief, which is implausible, right? And, um, and he also doesn't think that... There isn't any such notion as de re belief. But when you look at what he actually says, he really agrees with Sosa because some of our ordinary um, discourse would seem to involve predicates that express de re attitudes of belief or whatever, right? towards 
people look at this doctrine as stated on the bottom of 197, one is a minimal suspect if one, this is, he's talking about J. Edgar Hoover, who was supposed to be investigating some, uh, someone murdered Smith. Takes, one satisfies any definite description Hoover takes to pick out Smith's murder. It follows trivially that Smith's murder is a minimal suspect because he satisfies the description of Smith's murder, even in the situation where Hoover is utterly baffled but merely believes the crime has been committed by a single culprit. This would be an objectionable consequence only if there were some principled way of distinguishing minimal suspects from genuine or true duray suspects, but there is not. And uh, Quine, for the same reasons, returned to his original view, right? Um, he said um, it's uh, this idea that anyone who believes that um, there are spies therefore believes that there is someone he believes to be a spy. And uh, these other consequences, like this, as Quine suggests, the apparently sharp psychological distinction between whoever believes is someone murdered Smith at the top of page 198, and someone is believed by Hoover to have murdered Smith, collapses the logical difference in the ontological commitment of the speaker remains. And that's why there's a second premise about existence. So Quine, Quine said uh, this originally seemed intolerable, but it grows on one. I remember uh, the comment of Egal in the audience that it didn't grow on him, but um, it did grow on a number of people at a certain time. And I know, and I, as I say, I remember giving a seminar in which I um, had to argue with a phalanx of pretty good uh, graduate students, right, uh, who um, did accept this view. Okay, um, and it... It was close to being, being accepted by someone, um, not on any of the past panels, anyway. Okay, all right. Now, mm. it remains true that in the case in which Hoover is baffled, he would actually deny to the press that there was anyone he believed to be the murderer. Mm. Now, Sosa in his article, which uh, still remains, to my knowledge, the best um, and most elaborate defense of this view, eventually says the best um, uh, solution is account one. S believes about X that is F, if and only if there's a singular term alpha that denotes X and is such that S believes alpha is F. By the way, there's a strange thing in Sosa's paper that I am just ignoring because I don't get it. He says, he, he uses Quine's quarters for S believes alpha is F and says that doesn't necessarily mean the same S believes that alpha is F, but as far as I can see, it does. So um, I'm just ignoring this. Okay. I suggested earlier that objections to this account might be meant by insisting that sometimes it is misleading to tell the truth. For example, it would be misleading of Hoover, right, to say that he suspects someone of the murder. Now, by the way, uh, in one way I'm going to deliberately um, deviate from ordinary language, which Dennett also does. Um, I mean, if the term the murder is enough to establish a dere belief, right, then Hoover doesn't only suspect of the murder that he committed the murder, he believes with absolute certainty, or at least believes that if there was a murder, that the murder committed, you know, if that was a unique neuron in the murder, committed it. The term suspects is too weak. Okay. Now, um, I'm just going to regard this distinction as obliterated as Dennett does, right, and call these people 
suspects. Um, of course, they are not just suspects, right? I mean, suppose, in fact, in the ordinary sense, um, Hoover does have a particular person picked out to a lot of evidence against him. So maybe he wasn't just a suspect anymore, right? But Hoover is accusing the person. Okay, but this, we will assume the extension of suspects includes, right, anyone with some sufficient degree of belief that the person is the murderer rather than that the person may be the murderer or probably is the murderer. Um, it's rather strange. These, these qualifications seem to uh, modify the that clause following believes that, but actually seem to actually attach to the strength of the or degree of belief. Yeah. Okay, now, so, uh, so this will be ignored henceforth. The explanation given for these views is supposed to be some, something, you know, deriving maybe from like Chrysian principles of pragmatics and so on, and um, these things are supposed to show that it could be misleading to tell the truth. For example, as uh, Sosa says, um, if I say I believe that P, right, and I actually know with certainty that P, that can be misleading and... um, well, actually, I think something else may be going on in this case, but, um, but uh, the point is that by making a weaker statement when you could have made a stronger one, right, uh, you may be making a false suggestion, right? Grice's classic example of this is um, uh, in his original paper where he tried to introduce these principles was um, that uh, saying something looks red may suggest uncertainty as to whether it really is red, right? Um, and so, uh, so some Oxford philosophers, though I actually don't know who in this case, um, uh, supposedly argued, that is, I, I have not seen this view expressed by anyone different, whereas other similar views I have seen, right? Um, uh, that uh, looks red can be properly said only when one is in some doubt as to whether it is really red, right? And that um, otherwise it's inappropriate to say that, right? Now, in fact, of course, looks red is a predicate with a certain extension. It doesn't coincide with red, but... um, Most things that clearly are red do fall in the extension of the predicate. Looks red also. Okay, so so it could be misleading to tell the truth by simply saying something too weak. Unfortunately, these authors don't um, seem to realize that they're committing themselves to something stronger, viz. that... um, uh, that, um, not only can it be misleading to tell the truth, say, because it's too weak, but it will actually give you better information to make the false statement. For example, that, that well, in the J. Edgar Hoover case here, right, that I, there are no suspects, right, which is supposed to be a false statement in the true semantics of English, right? Okay, now, that's a much more dubious doctrine um, of now and gives and if negation really means semantic negation is very um, is very unlikely. Look, David Lewis once pointed out to me that sometimes you can use what looks like a negation just to say that the statement being made is too weak. For example, um, someone says, oh, uh, the Iraq war has gone on 
at least a little bit longer than after Bush announced that it was through, right? Um, and then someone else um, of, uh, of a different persuasion can say, come on, it didn't go on at least a little bit longer. But he's not really calling the first statement false, right? But um, if one takes negation to really mean that one is calling the statement false, then one has a stranger doctrine that the non-misleading thing can be <coughs> to say something false. In this case, that there are no suspects, right? In this case, that there are no suspects. Now, um, and indeed, then it um, does give a reason. It remains true, page 198, in the case in which Huber is baffled, he would actually deny there was anyone he believed to be the murderer. What he would actually be denying is he knows more than anyone knows who knows only that the, the, the crime has been committed. Okay, now, um, uh, that is, it seems to be a doctrine held by some of these people that if you, um, uh, if something isn't true for anything other than the usual or trivial reasons, right? Um, you can call it false, right? Mm. Well, I, I don't think this is true, but I, well, I don't, I don't think this is true. For example, um, I should not say Gosh, my heart is not beating. But then, um, what? What? Oh, all I mean is that it's not beating for any reason that, um, other than the trivial one, right? Um, uh, see, no pacemaker, nothing, see, right? Okay, so um, uh, this is not, I think, an appropriate semantic principle. But, the main thing I w wish to point out and have um, mentioned in various seminars is the following uh, rather sweeping consequence of the view being advocated. Mm. Now, everyone except perhaps the deity um, has a false belief, right? Okay, for X, let the false belief in question be P. Okay? All right, now then, take the following. X believes that the Y, that is Philby, or alternatively, the tallest spy, if uh, someone hasn't heard of any particular spies, right? If P, and is the Eiffel Tower, if not P, now, this is a definite description determining some object, right? Is a spy. Now, X will believe this, right? Because X believes that P, right? And believes that Phil B is a spy, or alternatively, that the tallest spy is a spy, right? Okay, now, so from the doctrine of ex unrestricted exportation, we get X believes of the Eiffel Tower, that it is a spy. And does everyone see that? Because that's what's denoted by the um, definite description in question, right? Now, the Eiffel Tower can be replaced here by any identifiable object. I mean, any object that X can identify in X's own vocabulary is um, going to be believed by X to be a spy. Now, look, the natural view of the error in this argument is precisely what is being excluded because it's clear that X believes that the Y who satisfies the definite description he is giving is Philby. 
or is the smallest pie, but believes that that's who satisfies the definite description. But um, we can't put a condition, we can't make that remark because that is to invoke the very notion that supposedly is being questioned. Right? So anyway, since the Eiffel Tower can be replaced by any identifiable object, hence X believes of Y, that is F, can be reduced to. And here we're assuming F is a predicate that applies to material objects. And I'm including people, I mean anything that has a body, whether or not one is a materialist and thinks that's all there is to it, right? Okay, right. Okay, so, and animals and so on, right? As well as dead material objects, right, can be reduced to, X believes Y can be reduced to Y is identified by X, and X believes that there are Fs because, um, then we can use something like the tallest, but I think the most massive F, right, or whatever, right, if necessary, we could set a grid with rational coordinates on the whole world, right, and um, say the first one that hits any one of these rational coordinates, which can be enumerated. So, um, virtually every material object is identifiable for a normal X, so 11 really becomes 12x believes that there are f's. The statement is therefore only apparently relational between x and y. One thing, see, this is supposed to give the true semantics of English as opposed to what pragmatically we may be reading in or something or reading extra things into the statement that is being made non-trivial. But it is rather strange that any natural language would contain such a misleading locution at all since it apparently relates X to an object. Why? Huh? But in fact, the object disappears altogether in the normal case anyway. Right? So not only the tallest by, but every object is believed to be a spy. Now, I do not know whether Quine, Dennett, Sousa, and so on would accept even this awful consequence. I would hope not. Um, gosh, the Eiffel Tower, even that example, is a little weird, it's a little weird, it's a little weird. Okay, um, but um, not only the phosphorus listed, but others have advocated this view. Now, I don't know how much this view is still around, but I um, have wanted to make this consequence of it public for some time. Now, for knowledge, De Ray knowledge, we could not draw such a strikingly awful consequence. Because this depends on there being a false belief, right, in the definite description. And of course, if it's knowledge, um, we can't uh, do it that way. So the consequence won't be quite so awful. Um, Igor Kvart, who um, heard me talk about this once, said um, that, uh, well, yes, but of course, one's confidence in this kind of view will be greatly weakened because of the consequence about belief. And I think that's true. We need not look at the knowledge case. But um, it's interesting how this will come out for De Ray knowledge. So I took a look at this. Hmm. Now, 
the appropriate consequence for, in this case will be that the CIA believes of Y that Y is a spy if and only if Y is, in fact, a spy. We assume that the CIA believes that there are spies, right? Okay, now... Oh, sorry, Ed, I meant knows of why, because the whole point was the distinction between know, um, knowledge and belief, so this is a uh, miswriting uh, in the thing. Knows of, it believes of why, that why is by, that's everything, as I said before, including the Eiffel Tower, right? But um, knows of why has got to be more restricted, even on the unrestricted exportation view, right? But it will comprise all the spies because the um, CIA certainly will believe that the tallest spy is a spy, right? That's the standard example, right? And um, therefore will believe of the tallest spy that he or she is a spy, right? But the CIA will also believe of the second tallest spy <laughs> that he or she is a spy, right? And so on down the rank now. Of course, to avoid running into a vacuous description, we uh, should add a clause, or if there is none that short, back to the tallest spy, right? <laughs> so that one always gets a definite description naming a spy, right? Denoting a spy. So then the CIA will believe precisely, will know, sorry, no, I should stop saying believe, will know precisely of the set of all spies that they are spies. I don't know why they have so much work to do. Okay, now, perhaps this second consequence would even be accepted by some of these authors? I don't know. I mean, um, if Dennett thinks that um, J. Edgar Hoover thinks this is supposed to be a case of a unique murder, right? Thinks of Smith's murderer that he is a murderer simply by virtue of that definite description. What is so different about this case? Now, then it is talking about belief, but um, as I say, belief turns out to be much broader, but knowledge will come out exactly this way. Um, the CIA will know of exactly these spies that they are spies. <coughs> <coughs> How did these authors very specific conclusion, uh, confusions? Look at, for example, it on page 198. When um, Hoover is denying that there was anyone he believed to be the murderer, what he actually be denying is he knows more than anyone knows who knows only that the crime has been committed. He is certainly not denying that he has a deray belief directly about some individual to the effect that he is the murderer, a belief he has acquired by some intimate cognitive rapport with that individual. For suppose Hoover wrestled with the murderer at the scene of the crime in broad daylight, but has no idea who the person was with whom he wrestled. Surely on anyone's causal theory of Dere belief, that person is believed by him to be the murderer, but it would be most disingenuous for Hoover to claim to have a suspect. Now, um, but... Um, This example, um, if it was supposed to go along with intuition, will um, 
simply depends on the idea that um, if you have a DeRay belief about someone at one time, you can never lose it. But who, who says so? Why? I mean, uh, it, it would be quite intuitive to say that at the time, Hoover does believe of that person that he is the murderer, but later, he doesn't. This is just a very specific con uh, confusion. Another specific confusion that, uh, that seems to arrive in this literature is between, but these, these con confusions are of less interest to the philosophy of language. I just don't know why they arose. Um, Sosa talks about a case as follows, right? And this is, this, is, this is also just a very strange identification. I don't know why it got accepted. Dennett uh, endorses it more strongly and wittily. A similar example is that where a spy and his accomplished see through window how an investigator finds some incriminating evidence in the spy's footlocker. The spy and his accomplice can see that someone sees that whoever owns this footlocker is um, uh, a spy. The accomplice could very naturally say, he knows you are a spy now. You must escape. By the way, um, in spite of ignoring um, Russell on this stuff, Sosa actually does mention him. Uh, one thing which is Russellian is identifying de re belief with belief um, expressible with a pronoun or a variable. And I'm going to assume that this is correct. Okay, right. So he knows you're a spy now. You must escape. In fact, and so far as the accomplished knows, the investigator does not know the spy and knows practically nothing about him. The footlocker had been searched only as part of a general investigation of the base. What the investigator knows is the owner of the footlocker is a spy. Since the accomplice is right to export, the owner of the footlocker is a distinguished term in the circumstances. This is supposed to show how um, relative it is, because sometimes you would think the owner of uh, the footlocker could not be exported. Um, uh, well, Dennett echoes this example. Um, uh, it's a sim similar thing. Hoover knows various bits of evidence, uh, page 197. Since George is the lone satisfier of Hoover's description, Hoover believes of George that he did it. No, he says, George says, Hoover knows only that whoever fits this description is Smith's murder. He doesn't know that I fit the description, so he doesn't know that I'm Smith's murder. Wake me up when you learn that I am suspected. Now, um, the intuitions of these people here are very strange because, um, I mean, there are two distinct ones. One is whether a criminal has been identified. The other is whether the criminal is in danger of being caught. The criminal might well have been identified and unfortunately because he escaped or whatever, um, uh, be in no danger of being caught, right? Um, so, in fact, I mean, in the newspapers just this last week, um, I think of this criminal Vesco, what's his first name? Robert Vesco, supposed to have probably died in Cuba. You know, and he, he wasn't caught by the Americans anyway, right? Um, uh, the notorious Dr. Mengele, I believe, managed to live under his own real name in Brazil. You know, the notorious Auschwitz doctor, right? Um, have some connections with the family business, whatever it is, right? And so on. Uh, and he simply died in Brazil. But that doesn't mean that there was any question that anyone knew of him, right? That he did this or that, right? On the other hand, someone may be in grave danger of being caught because uh, 
Only a little more investigation of the police will identify him and he's in danger uh, and will be caught. So why these authors have confused these two subjects is a bit of a puzzle to me, but um, it doesn't have perhaps a broader significance for the philosophy of language. But what really does have a broad significance for the philosophy of language Now, it is certainly true that Christ showed that under some circumstances, pragmatically, one wouldn't assert something because of various principles. He actually laid down some principles. Never a principle, I think, that you can deny that P, simply if P is true only for trivial reasons, right? which is a very strange principle. But um, there are other principles. So I mentioned looks red, and this is a predicate with an extension, and the extension has little to do that you wouldn't say looks red if the thing, if you're actually trying to tell someone that it is red, right? Okay, right. Um, that might sound as if you were in doubt. And there are other cases given by Christ, and uh, Christ, for example, mentions that... Um, under certain circumstances, if you say that you saw a man with a woman, you wouldn't say that if the woman were his wife, sister, mother, or even close platonic friend. Um, And perhaps there are such circumstances. The well-known joke, um, who was that lady I saw you with? That was no lady, that was my wife, is an even better illustration of the Gricean principle. Okay, now, um, nevertheless, the extension of woman or lady applies to all appropriate females and is not going to be changed by specific conventions like this. Mm. However, Moreover, Christ created a general attitude echoed, for example, by myself in my paper, Speaker's Reference and Semantic Reference, that one should try to keep the semantic simple and um, maybe, you know, and describe pragmatic reasons for various things. (laughs) However, This principle can be overused. And this is the first moral I want to um, talk about in the philosophy of language. That is, that we should not think of pragmatic uh, considerations as a wastebasket. And uh, this is... Well illustrated by um, Dennett's remark, one is a minimal suspect. He says, if one, page 198, if one satisfies any definite description of her takes to pick out Smith's murder, it follows trivially that Smith's murder is a minimal suspect because even in the case the situation where Hoover is utterly battled, baffled. This would be an objectionable consequence only if there were some principled way of distinguishing minimal suspects from genuine or true or true de re suspects, but there is not. Now, what does a principled way of making a distinction mean? That means um, if then it can think, probably not um, taking too long, right, of the way of making the distinction, right? Uh, We can then say that the semantics is very simple and um, any tendency we have to talk otherwise is mere pragmatics. Now, and that is supposed to be something that... um, Dennett and other philosophers don't have to think about. See, right? Okay, right. Uh, now, 
Consider, for example, a statement like this. I mean, such terms of suspects are predicates, right? So consider, for example, 14. For every two people the uh, Chicago police, uh, this base three, suspect of the crime, the New York police suspect three. This is a crime that has been done in uh, perhaps collaboration. And uh, this is a ratio. It might be that there are four suspects and that the Chicago police have and six that the New York police have. Now, we have uh, seen that the extension of suspect according to the um, Dennett, Sosa, Klein, and others' view will be, is in fact much bigger. But let's suppose it's what they think, so it includes all the guilty parties, right? That is, you know, the, 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 the tallest person involved in this prime, the second tallest, and so on, right? And that all the suspects that um, you know, all the people suspected in Chicago and New York are in fact innocent, let's say, right? So, the true extension of the term suspect will therefore include these people plus the guilty parties, right? And the ratio is very likely to be wrong, right? Now, given my example <coughs> involving the false belief in the disjunction, of course, then the situation is even actually worse, right? So that statement 14 will be, of course, literally false, even according to the uh, few as, as Dennett and Sosa and uh, Klein and so on think, but even worse according to my view. It will be false. Now, the point is this. Such terms are sus as suspect are predicates. They interact with quantifiers and count, counting and such like that in the language, and we have to project them to a wide variety of sentences. Now, how then can a sentence like 14 be explained? See, it can only be explained by saying that, well, in addition to literal English, at which all these statements are trivially false and should not even be considered or made, there is something else, pragmatic English, which confused speakers not realizing the uh, principles uh, you know, stated by um, Dennett and Sosa and so on, do accept, right? and do use in having these predicates interact with quantifiers and count nouns. And there must be some principles of projection that will enable one to evaluate the statements of confused English or pragmatic English over the entire language. Mm. <coughs> Then, what, what does it matter that Dennett cannot think of the uh, principles that speakers actually use? There must, be, there must be some other language, pragmatic English, that these speakers do, in fact, use, right? And that maybe don't draw what he calls principle distinctions. That is, distinctions that are very easy to formulate. You see, I mean... It's, it's hard for me, actually, to think whether one can um, formulate, in his sense, a principal distinction over whether, when it's correct to say, it is raining, how far away, you know, where, just so and so, right? But, um, uh, but even, even if that isn't the case, right, um, the principle involved do, doesn't have to be and cannot be so simple-minded here. If there is another language, pragmatic English, right, erroneously leading speakers to attach these false truth values, 
to all kinds of um, sentences involving predicates that involve belief of a person that he did this or that, right? Then, um, well, why not say that pragmatic English is English itself? And why well, maybe have to think harder about the matter than Dennett was willing to do, see, right? Um, uh, even though the distinctions drawn are not what he calls principled. Okay, now. So, that is the first moral I want to draw from this discussion. Um, uh, under the influence of Christ, we have sometimes gone too far, right? Let's make the semantics simple as possible, right? And the rest is all pragmatics and we don't have to think about it. But sometimes we do have to think about it and then maybe it should be put into the semantics of the language. Pragmatic considerations are not a wastebasket. Ordinary speakers seem to be able to handle these distinctions that supposedly cannot be made. And perhaps we should just take a better look at what they are. And if they are too hard, we may just have to admit that they are too hard at the present time and that we don't have a complete semantics for um, this kind of predicate. Okay, because uh, then it isn't denying their ray predicates. Now, second thing is what I call second uh, general problem in the philosophy of language about this is what I call the toy duck fallacy. Mm. Now, let me give an example of this. Um, uh, because on the one hand, the people I've been criticizing have uh, talked about all kinds of examples that they call um, that um, they must take to be literally false or incorrect. Right? But on the other hand, there can be a tendency to give examples as if they were correct that have got to be literally false. Look, a parent takes her or his child to a um, toy store, right? Toys are plastic models of various animals. Okay. Um, and child acts of, oh, is that a, is that a goose? And um, then the parent says, uh, no, uh, that's a duck. That's a duck. Now, what can we draw, what morals can we draw from this? First, that there are really two kinds of ducks. Some made of living organism material, others of mere plastic, right? Because wasn't the parent correct to say, that's a duck, right? Say, um, or the term duck is ambiguous. It has a narrow sense in which a duck has to be alive, right? And a broader one in which it could be made of plastic, right? Okay, um, and well, there are various, there are various other um, morals that could be drawn to this, like um, uh, I don't know, duck, duck has only the broad sense, including both plastic and um, and uh, organs made of uh, ducks made of biological tissue, but in certain contexts. There is a pragmatic implication that the duck is actually alive. See, right? Okay, now, none of these conclusions are correct. Now, one has to be very careful when giving an example in the philosophy of language that it is not a toy duck example. Now, one sign of a toy duck example would be um, 
in this case, the child might ask, but, but, but look, is this a real duck? No, this is not a real duck, right? Um, uh, unfortunately, probably situations can be set up in a toy store where even that won't work, right? But it can be of help, right? Uh, mm, mm, mm. Sometimes real might be used in a toy store, even in a misleading or incorrect sense, I think. But usually that will help. OK, now let me um, mention this in connection with one example given by Sosa. But I'm actually not going to give Sosa's actual example, but um, uh, beef it up even a little more. Right. OK. Mm. OK, there is a, uh, certain arsonist or, um, who comes to be known to the police as the metropolitan pyromaniac or something like that, right? Now, I'm, I'm changing Sosa's example a little bit, right? Now, the police usually can identify whether a fire is set by this, by this particular criminal, though they have not identified who it is in any ordinary sense, right? Mm. Okay, now, change Sosa's example a little bit. Now, the criminal, otherwise, otherwise in every other way, a solid citizen, but with this special compulsion to do these sometimes, and not suspected at all in the ordinary sense by the police, right, um, is talking to his wife. Um, uh, the, um, now, another fire has been set, and in fact, he didn't do it in this case. In Sosa's example, he did do it, but I think it's even more interesting if he didn't do it, right? Okay, and um, uh, the wife says to him, look, the police think that you, you did this one too. Now, that is supposed to show, according to Sosa, how very um, uh, relative the question of exportation can be because the police, in some other ordinary sense, have no idea that he did anything, right? Yet the wife can say this to him. Right? And I think it's even more interesting when, in fact, in this case, he didn't do it. Okay, right? Okay. Um, uh, uh, the police think you did this one too. Now, so that's supposed to be used as an example to show, to show how relative it can be whether one can export, right? But I suggest that this is a toy duck case. And one has to really worry in giving examples in the philosophy of language that one is not falling into a toy duck case. I mean, the wife says, they think you did this one too, right? But of course he can, you know, can reply appropriately, oh, come on, they don't really think I did anything. Like the police, the chief of police is one of my best friends. You know, right? Um, and this reply is correct, A, I think, and B, amounts to a rejection of this case as a toy duck case. Okay, so here there is a situation where I do not know really how to explain it but there are conventions in certain situations 
as in the toy store. Or perhaps, you know, in my own account of uh, fictional characters is another such case. See, one, see um, where one can speak as if this were really an A when it isn't an A. See, right? Now, a dictionary should not include under duck one, a fowl that swims in the water, two, an object found in a toy store or something like that. But meaning number two should not be in the dictionary, right? Neither should this pyromaniac case be an example to support the fact that uh, sometimes very funny predicates can be exported when, one does it, when the police really, in the normal sense, have little idea who it is, right? So, look, these are, these are the two morals that I want to draw about this in the philosophy of language, and the second one is a uh, strange issue in semantics which I don't quite know how to explain, that is, why these conventions arise. John Austin, who gives a somewhat, but it's not as clearly a correct example, says it's the cut down on verbiage, but it doesn't seem to me to be, and his example may not be right, but it sort of influenced me. Um, but uh, I don't know how much verbiage is being cut down on. <laughs> that is so you say, no, this is a plastic duck, or this is a plastic so <laughs> See, it's so, takes so much longer to say that. See, right. <laughs> No, so I don't think that is the explanation, right? But there are these special contexts, and perhaps we ought to figure out a better explanation of them. Okay, now, I want finally to make a remark on a related view, which I have heard from uh, various, um, well, from some people, um, who may be quite uh, good. One is that um, though one is that the ordinary language may have these locutions. Like there is someone I believe to be a spy. They should be banned from so-called scientific language. I mean, a very good philosopher has um, said this to me. Um, uh, uh, well. Among the things, see, this comes, of course, from the Quinean view that um, any all ways of identifying an object are on a par, which is what, you know, lies behind this whole view of unrestricted exportation, right? Quine always applied it to modal logic and then only later to... Uh, for example, on this view, computability theory, recursion theory, would not be a serious science. Because suppose we have a non-computable function f, then f of n certainly stands for a certain number, right? And to say that where we, in the case of another function, g, where we can compute the answer as m, right, is to adopt, as Klein would put it, a frankly inequalitarian attitude <laughs> towards two ways of designating the same number, right? But, that is just what computability theory does do. Um, it says that um, if f is a non-computable function, and all you know is that it is well-defined at n, and so its value is f of n, there is no number of which you know that it is the value, you don't know which number is the value, and so on. A computable function is one where you always by applying an appropriate process can get 
the answer. Okay, and there, there are other things, you know, the complexity here in wall, so um, serves as an example if you know what that is. Now, something I know less about and was uh, pleased to be introduced in the morning with a uh, message from Larry Tribe. Maybe he would know. Another, another case in which de Ray de Ray notions are obviously quite important and should not be trivialized, right, is, in fact, the criminal law, the very thing referred to by Dennett and Sosa. But I know less about the significance of these things in the criminal law and really need to find out more research. Um, First... The police often make official announcements as to whether so-and-so is indeed a suspect. Perhaps Stephen, who's been involved in the law search, I wish could give Chef some advice about this, right? A grand jury in this country often will set, send someone a warning letter, and this is, stay away, it's about the person, these two, a particular person, right? That he or she is a target of the investigation, a so-called target letter. And then, of course, there may eventually even be an indictment of the person. Now, um... The indictment will normally contain a proper name, but I suppose that some cases probably have existed where the uh, grand jury uh, doesn't know the person's name and the person has refused to tell him, right? And uh, uh, identifies, uh, indicts the subject perhaps under some definite description, but... um, that it be an indictment of this suspect and not another one is also a de Ray notion and would once again get trivialized, you see, if um, uh, the universal exportation rule were um, adopted and any old definite description could occur in the grand jury indictment. I, I actually... Um, saw a lawyer from a uh, foreign civil law country and asked how it was uh, there, right? Uh, with a, um, well, they, they wouldn't have grand juries. See, but um, had very, they, they didn't seem to have, at least in that country, any analogous practice of target letters and so on, right? So, um, uh, of course, the final thing, the investigating magistrate will charge someone the same way as in this country the grand jury will do. So, look, I mean, anyone who, anyone who says that these notions are not serious, either from the point of view of science or from the point of view of the law, is, I think, wrong. And no one, just to make his or her philosophy of language very easy and not having to draw too many distinctions, right, should try to do otherwise. Now, as I say, I don't know whether anyone here has fallen into any of this, uh, though I've certainly, people I've known and respected have, um, uh, but um, I still thought that I ought to present a paper showing the extreme consequences of this view and the problems both for the philosophy of language, the troubles for the philosophy of language and for um, what is scientifically acceptable that result from this trivialization. (laughs) 
You've been listening to the CUNY Lecture Series. For more, visit CUNY Radio online at cuny.edu slash radio. The CUNY Lecture Series is a production of the Office of University Relations.